I want to continue our teaching about the kingdoms um, of this world being ruled by, by demons. And last time we were together, we looked at this subject matter with respect to the fact that um, Jesus said in John's gospel, chapter 18, that this is not his kingdom. So there's a lot to be explained, I think, about the understanding of the kingdoms. But I, what I'd like to do to, to, in this session tonight, in the prayer meeting with the time that we have allotted, is to look at and verify and validate that if you are a, a person of, of immense or any power of influence in this world on planet Earth, no matter whether it be in Lima, Peru, or whether it be in Kiev, Ukraine, you're a demon possessed. He allows no one to play basketball. He allows no one into industries of great influence unless you have bowed down to worship him. Now he made that offer to Jesus. He made the same offer to Eve. Jesus, of course, understood the offer, and I'm gonna read it in a few moments, that this is Satan's kingdom. What God does, contra Contrary, the opposite of what Satan does, is God seeks to form a nation or to find a man or to find a prophet and preferably to find a people that will establish or build or represent his kingdom and his law. But he's under no mistake that, that Satan runs this planet. And we're going to see that as we go forward. I... Um, what I want to do in the session tonight is to look at the, the sparse encounters that Satan or his demons have publicly had with humanity. More specifically, Satan himself, that he has been quite wise, quite cunning, I should say, more likely, with his, the, the sparseness of his encounters with humanity. That is to say he's not all over the place, all over everywhere, talking to everybody. But there is, and then of course the same thing with his demons. They have been quite cunning about their appearances as well. And of course the fewer the appearances, the fewer times which their habits and their powers can be detected. But I'd, I'd like to look at the encounter um, Satan had with um, and there, are three, there are three encounters, and perhaps the third one's going to be a little bit controversial, controversial for you um, when, we, when we take a look at it. There is the wilderness experience where Satan actually manifests himself to Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 11. Now, most of you are probably familiar with this, but in light of, I want to read the verses in light of, you want to look at Satan's encounters and you want to look at the power of this kingdom in light of the fact that his contact with humanity in terms of revealing himself is quite sparse. And that is a cunning move. And there's a reason for it. But also I want you to look at, as I read the scriptures to think now, as he makes these offers to Jesus, he is not lying. He's not selling wolf tickets. He's not saying what he has. Uh, is not it, 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 that Jesus knows that this, Jesus knows that it is that it is His. That's number two. Number three. While I read, go through this scripture and the other two encounters after this one, we want to also in, look at the fact that what Satan does, very with, with absolute cunningness, is that he uses scripture. He doesn't go out in left field. Um and start chanting something that no one knows or heard anything about. In all of his encounters, he always uses scripture. However, in many instances, he twists the scriptures or flat out blasphemes them, but always scripture. He never comes. Remind me to say to all of the people who say that the Old Testament is irrelevant and that the law of God is irrelevant. Satan doesn't think so. He thinks it's most relevant, and he uses it consistently in pulpits around the world. So now let's look at 
uh, Matthew's gospel chapter four, verse one, it said, then, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The Holy Ghost led him out there. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. All right, that's what the devil said to him. But he, being Jesus, answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I want to go to the book of Deuteronomy in just a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And I want to show you what Jesus and Satan are dealing with at this point. Satan's first words to Jesus, you're the son of God, turn the stones into bread. Here's what Jesus responds to him. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, it says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doeth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of of the Lord do if man live. Just once more, and I'll probably do it several once more, to all those who say that the Old Testament is irrelevant, that the word of God, the law of God is irrelevant, I want you to know Satan doesn't think so, and neither does Jesus. So in Matthew's Gospel chapter four, in that encounter where Satan encounters a cost Jesus in the wilderness, Jesus responds to him, was man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Okay, we, we've gotten that. Then, verse five, now we're looking at the sparseness and the cunningness of Satan in his sparse demonstrations or appearances to any of humanity, and including his demons, and for reasons that are quite smart, quite wise as he rules this kingdom. So now he doesn't get, Jesus does not try to demonstrate how bad he is, he just quotes scripture. That scripture from the Old Testament backed the devil down for that moment. And I'll tell you now that the law of God of Moses from Deuteronomy will back the devil down. I've gone ahead and said that the Sabbath law, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, will back the devil down. And one of our successes here at our church is that we're Sabbath keepers. But let's go further. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city and, and sitteth him on the pinnacle of the temple and saith unto them, if thou be the son of God, okay, all right, you are who you say you are, cast thyself down. For he, it is written, and it is written, and I'm not going to go to that scripture at this moment, but the devil is quoting scripture. The devil says it is written, and it is written in the Psalms. Absolutely, as the devil quotes it. So tell all these people that don't want to quote the Old Testament anymore, the devil thinks there's a lot of power in the Old Testament. Too bad you don't think so. Or is it that you're covering up something? The devil says to him, it's written in the Bible. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and there their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Absolute quotation of scripture. Well, the Old Testament is still relevant. It's still re and if you want to have power, quote it. Preach it. Teach it. Jesus used the Old Testament. <laughs> the devil does too. But you know, all these churches, these modern day churches, they don't use it anymore. They're smarter than both Jesus and the devil, of course. And they've got huge flowing congregations that come every week to hear them abuse the Old Testament. Verse seven, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So they're back and forth with the word of God. They're not talking some Black Lives Matter nonsense. It's crazy. At that level, that kind of conversation doesn't appeal to any one of these superpowers. These two superpowers meeting, they're talking scripture. They're going back and forth with scripture. They're not dealing with Black Lives Matter or none of that other nonsense that y'all talk about. They're dealing word for word. The battle is with the word. Jesus, the devil said it's written. Jesus come back and write again and said, it is also written. Good God Almighty. As they go at one another. 
And the devil taking him up into an exceeding high mountain and showing him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Well, Jesus saith unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For again, it is written, the word of God, it is written. So what we want to demonstrate here, you can say that these people have come to power. You can say that Steph Curry has come to power or Venus Williams have come to power. Or you can say that Obama has come to power or whoever you want to point up. Kenneth Copeland has come to power. Joyce Myers has come to power. Whoever you want to point to is that Jay-Z and Beyonce has come to power because they got talent. That don't mean a thing to the devil. The kingdoms of this world belong to him. Understand that. He told Jesus, this, this belongs to me. And nobody gets anywhere unless you bow down and worship me. The devil told Jesus, but if you worship me, I'll give it to you. Jesus said, you should worship the Lord thy God and him only. And that ended that event. I think it's important that we look at that first encounter of, of, of Satan with Jesus in the wilderness. But you, you know, he, um, Satan also encountered Eve in the, in the garden. And he comes to Eve, I'll read it in Genesis chapter 3. And again, it's not about some hocus pocus, if you will, some newfangled, whether you speak in tongues or don't speak in tongues, that kind of a, if you will, newfangled ideology. It is simply about God's word. Satan understands his, 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 his enemy is the word of God, not somebody's idea. He knows that. And he never touches anything that's beneath the word of God. Doesn't deal with it. It's unimportant. Anybody, any man's idea is unimportant. If it ain't God's word, he's not interested in it. Because you know, he knows it has no power. But he knows that God's word does have power, even though he owns this kingdom. The word of God supersedes that. So watch this, all right? Adam and Eve, they got the kingdom. They got the world. They got dominion. They got it going on. They got the kingdom, Adam and Eve. The devil shows up. Watch what he says. Chapter 3, verse 1 of Genesis. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, have God said, or is it God's word? Ye shall eat, you shall not eat of the tree of the, of, you, should eat of the, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Is it God's word? He's not dealing with some hocus pocus newfangled ideas, some LGBTQ, some new ideas or some new motivation or some song. The devil don't go down that road. It's pointless. It's useless. If it ain't God's word, it ain't got no power. So he said to, the, he said to Eve, is it God's word? Is that God's word? You shall not eat of, the, of every tree. And the woman said unto the serpent, verse 2, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God have said, or oh, it's God's word, it's God's law, it's God's word, it's the Old Testament law, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. So there you go. It's only what I'm saying. You know what happened thereafter. She, she went ahead and she ate anyway. So we got these two encounters, right? Both times the devil himself shows up personally. He doesn't send a demon. He comes personally to Eve. He comes personally to Jesus. And he gets them. He realizes he's got power, but he has to first overcome something that is eternal. And that's the word of God. Three times with Jesus. One time with Eve and she fell for the okie doke. There's, there's two other incidents I want to point up. And, uh, and then we'll see where we can go from there. The, um, um, I think the other incident that we want to point up is um, the Gadarene event where the demon, this time it's not the devil himself, but he sends one of his henchmen, <laughs> one of his demons. And that's, I guess, some very important things 
I want to say about that in the future. So Jesus is in the north country in the Lake Genesaret, Galilee, and see it's all the same. And he gets out the boat, and there's a graveyard nearby. Well, let's just read it. Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. Now remember, as I read this, let's keep in focus that this world belongs to the devil. This kingdom, all of it, all of it, all of it. I said all of it, I said all of it belongs to the devil. And um, he knows it. God knows it. But the devil also understands scripture. He understands God's word. He knows what God has said. And he doesn't discount it. So, so what we're trying to establish here is the craftiness of the devil in terms of the appearances that he makes that are quite sparse. He doesn't show up just for anybody and everybody. But he showed up with Jesus in the wilderness. He showed up with Eve in the garden. And each time, the devil didn't go some mumbo jumbo, if you will, uh, some kind of weird ideas of this or that or the other. He went directly at the word. And Jesus responded with the word, back and forth. The devil said it's written, Jesus said it's written. The devil said this is written, Jesus said. So you have to realize that the word can be twisted by an ill use of the devil. Then Jesus had to come back and correct it and bring another scripture that points out your use of the word of God is a twisted word. You saw that with Jesus and the devil. But watch this. There's something else that I think we need to be mindful of. We're talking about these demons. And, and they came over into the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. Verse 2, and when he was come out of the ship, that being Jesus, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now, Mark is working this, uh, this demon as an unclean spirit. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him. No, not with chains. We'll talk about that later. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, and neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains, and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, this is what the demons said. What have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou son of the most high God, I assure thee by God that thou torment me not. Let me interpret that for you. The devil knows that Jesus is the son of God. He knows it. The demon knows it. The, the, the Satan went a different route. He told Jesus to prove it. The demon, no such thing. He says, I know you're the son of God, but I also know this, that your time of ruling humanity is not yet. Right now, we're in charge. Right now, we rule. So I don't know what you're doing here, for the time is not yet. You, it, you can't destroy me now. You, can't, you cannot defeat me. It, you, he told Jesus, you are governed, you are prohibited by the word of God from trying to destroy me. You are prohibited. The time is not yet. The word of God establishes when that, if that time should come, but it's not now. He told, he told, the devil told Jesus. He said, I assure thee by the word of God, by thee, by, thee by God, that thou torment me not. And Jesus said for, for he said unto him, Jesus has said unto the man, come out of him, come out of the man, that unclean spirit. Uh, Jesus has told him, called the spirit out. And he asked him, what is thy name? And the unclean spirit answered and said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And be, he besought him much that he would not send him away out of the country. In other words, the devil is saying, I'm going to stay right here in the north country, in the Gadarenes. I want to stay right here in Joel Osteen's church. Now, you, I'll come out of this man, but what about the one over yonder? 
I don't want to leave this country. I want to stay right here. Don't send me to Africa. Don't send me to, uh, to Europe. I want to stay here. And I, according to the plan of word of God, you cannot destroy me now. You, it's not time. So here's what Jesus did. And uh, now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine, pork chop, baby back ribs, feeding. You know the rest of it. Jesus sent the devil into the swine. The Bible said they ran over the cliff and they were choked in the sea. And those same demons came about the swine and then joined the Baptist church. <laughs> So the devil knows God's word. He knows it. He knows that the time of the lake of fire is not now. He knows that everything in this kingdom, save the elect, is ruled by the devil. He knows that. He knows that Jesus is not in charge. He knows that. And he says to Jesus that it's not time for you to do what perhaps you think you will do. Satan also said, the demons say that, but the devil says to Jesus, he says to him, in the garden, he says to him that uh, you, want, you want to have power, you want to rule this kingdom, any of them, I give them all to you, but you don't get it unless you worship me. And Jesus said, no, we worship the Lord. And the other item, of course, that we want to drill into your spirit is that this is not some sort of hocus pocus ideology. They're going back and forth with the word of God. The devil knows the word. Jesus confronts the devil with the word, with the law, with the word of God. And in this instance, the demons are cast out of the man. They go into a swine, which is quite unusual, uh, but perhaps not unprecedented. But obviously when the swine are choking to see the demons leaving, who knows where they go after that? I made the joke about where they did go. So um, when we look at what's happening in, the, in these two incidents, the Old Testament incident was in the garden, and um, Satan, I don't know if he misquoted the scripture, he, he said to Jesus, he knew that Moses had said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the God. The devil knew the scripture. So, here's the scene. Jesus is fasting, he's 40 days, has eaten a thing in 40 days. The devil knows the scripture. He finds Jesus, he said to him, you're breaking your fast, right? The 40 days are up, I didn't bother you. All 40 days I let you stay out here, have your fast. 40 days up, you're gonna break your fast? Turn the stones into bread, you're the son of God. You don't have to wait for anybody to go bake something for you. You're the son of God, turn the stones into bread. You're fasting 40 days, Jesus. Turn the, what's, what's, so, what's so wrong about that? That's not a sin. What's so wrong about, you've been fasting for 40 days, why should you wait another day to get back into town to eat bread? Turn the stone, you're the son of God. You got authority. Turn the stones into bread. It was in that same wilderness, you'll mind, mind you, or across the sea, that Moses taught about man shall not live by bread alone. So at this point, the devil is quite cunning in his approach to Jesus because he's using scripture, he's using reason, and it makes sense. You're fasting, you're gonna break your fast. Do a miracle and break your fast. Where's the sin? Show me what's wrong with that. Show me where the sin is in that. Show me where the sin is. The devil said, man does not live by bread alone. Jesus said, Jesus said to the devil, man does not live by bread alone or by miracles. But man's life consists of every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. He backed the devil down. But it was, a, it was a mighty ploy. Most people would have gone for it. Most people would have said, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm the son of God, I'm this, I'm that, and, and would have turned the stones into bread. And they would have turned into bread. Moses beat the rock. Got God ain't. Most people would have done it. Most people would have, because it didn't seem to be a sin. 
But Jesus knew the deal. And he didn't go for it. And so he gets accosted again, and you know the other two events. And with Eve, she falls for it. She falls for the hook, line, and sinker. The word of God says you can eat of every tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She eats of it. She gives it to her husband. He ain't got no better sense. He eats of it as well. We got death. And Satan's got victory. Because they stop living by God's word. So it's important that we understand that Satan will twist God's word. He'll misquote it. He'll misapply it. And then he is smart enough to present it in such a way that it almost lines up with the original intent of God for the use of the word. But behind it, lurking behind it, is a dark and an evil passion. And he knows it. And so many fall for that day in and day out. But Jesus doesn't. I would like to, um, to say to this modern day, because I've, you've heard me establish that the same thing that the devil did in heaven when he had convinced the angels to follow him, he's done the same thing with all the churches. He's told them, follow me. Uh, you want to be powerful? You want to fly a private jet? You want to have your own private jet? You want to be Kenneth Copeland? Not only have your private jet, you got several of them, and you got your own runway. You don't have to go to no airport to take off. You don't need no, you got your own, Kenneth Copeland has his own tower. He has his own runway. He's got his own joint. Kenneth Copeland, he's got several private planes. Kenneth Copeland, you want to have that? Bow down and worship me. He understands that. And Kenneth Copeland twists the word of God all day and all night. And most people sitting up there know it's twisted, but they want it too. They want what he's got. And of course, they allow them. So, and, and, and Satan would not allow <laughs> Graham or Copeland or Osteen or any of these people to rise to great influence and power unless they were worshiping him, paying obeisances to him. No need to be clear about that. But then you got some people out there, which is I think the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life, who are discounting the Old Testament. Well, we're no longer under the law now. I know that's what Paul said. We're no longer, I talk about under grace and I talk about grace as dress. We're no longer under the law. We don't have to keep the law anymore. We don't have to keep the Old Testament. The Old Testament is out, out of date. Let's be clear. Let's be clear. First of all, God's word in the Old Testament or any place else for that matter. God's word, when God speaks, the very essence of him being God, his word cannot be outdated. You're looking at an impossibility for what God says to somehow or another lose his power or become sugar water weak or return to him void. It's impossible. It's impo if God said something, it never is out of date. It's never, if you will, out distance. It is never overcome. God's word cannot get old or outdated. Simply because he said it 10,000 years ago in man's years, somehow or another, that makes God's word aged and old and now we need to need something new. You got to be out your mind to think that somehow or another God's word can be outdated. Or, 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 or moreover, overturned. You can't overturn God's word. You can't do it. You can't overturn it. And God's word will not return unto him void, unable to accomplish the thing wherein God is willing. Get that straight, all you people out there talking about the Old Testament is irrelevant. It is ridiculous. It is preposterous. It is beyond satanic to think that when God said something, well, five years from now, it won't mean the same thing. You won't have the same power. You must be some kind of new fool. You got to be, some, these churches got to be some kind of new fool to think that Age makes God's word ineffective. Hell, wine gets better with age. <laughs> I look and I, you can hardly believe these churches. You can hardly believe. Hey, the Old Testament, we don't have to follow that anymore. 
You can hardly believe that anybody would be crazy enough to accuse God's word of being invalid. Jesus said himself, listen, heaven and earth will pass away before one period, one question mark of the word of God will fail. You got to be out your mind. And people are running into churches every Sunday. We don't keep the Sabbath no more. We make our own Sabbath. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Anyway, the um, Isaiah is the one who declared that God's word will not return unto him void. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 55, we went through that a few uh, days ago. All right. The, um, now here's the thing that's gonna get me in trouble. I'm, I'm willing to go down that road and this is gonna, this is gonna challenge you and you're gonna end up accusing me. You're gonna end up, even though I just offered an argument that you hear argued every day and you sit down there and watch Joyce Meyer or Paula White or Kenneth Copeland or T.D. Jakes, you watch them every day say that God's word is old and ineffective and feeble like an old man. You watch them every day. You read their books every day. Okay. But I'm going to do something that's also going to cause many of you to, to challenge, and you're going to challenge me. But I'm the Lord's servant, and I'm going to go ahead and say it. So there's an incident in John's gospel, or an event, I should say. There's an event in John's gospel, chapter 3. <clears throat> Starting at verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. And by the way, Nicodemus was in that crowd that Jesus called snakes, hypocrites, blind guides, fools. He was in that crowd when Jesus called him that, he was there. He was one of the Pharisees at the time. But the Bible says he comes to Jesus a little bit later on at night. And he says to Jesus, he says, we as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we as the Sanhedrin, not himself alone, not himself alone, we've had a council with the 70 elders. We know, and I represent them, we know, Nicodemus says, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He said, we know that. We the Pharisees know that. We know what you called us, but we also know there is no way you could do what you're doing if God wasn't with you. We know that. We know that. Um, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, completely different from the conversation, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is a latter-day word. Now, let me tell you the thing that's going to upset you. I'm going to tell you, and I'll demonstrate with Scripture if you need me to do so. I'm going to say to you that the Pharisees council, Pharisees, Sadducees, Nicodemus being their representative, they came to Jesus in a night meeting, they had counseled themselves together. And they had said, Jesus is the Son of God. But they had said it by a demonic spirit. Nicodemus didn't come to Jesus with the Holy Ghost. He didn't come with a revelation. He came as a demon. He said, we as a group know that thou art the Son of God. Let me, let me say this before you run out and turn the, your, your television off or your whatever it is. Let me say this. Remember when, remember when the devil himself accosted Jesus? What's the first thing he said to him? If thou be the Son of God, is that right? Is that what he said? Is that what he said? 
He said, you're the son of God, right? Turn the stones into bread. Well, so when he comes back representative of the Pharisees, he said, you're the son of God. No man can do this teaching you're doing unless God be with them. You're the son of God. But it was not the Holy Ghost in Nicodemus. It was the devil. Well, let me say this. First of all, Nicodemus didn't have the Holy Ghost. That's the first thing. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. He is quoting the same thing that the Gadarene demoniac said to Jesus in the graveyard, thou the son of God, Jesus, thou son of God, the same thing that the devil said in the wilderness, Jesus, thou son of God, the same thing that Nicodemus, though he's dressed a little better, got a little bit better education, probably got a better hairdo, but the same demon is saying, you're the son of God. That's why you're doing this work. But he's not saying that by the Holy Ghost. First of all, because Nicodemus doesn't have the Holy Ghost. There's no way Nicodemus can claim the Holy Ghost revealed this to me. And the reason why I said Jesus changed the subject on him and for a lot of day for all of us is because Jesus says this to Nicodemus, that no man can see the kingdom of God on his own unless he has the Holy Ghost, unless he's been born again been born of the Spirit, unless you've been born of the Holy Ghost, you can't see the kingdom. In other words, let's say for instance a, a person, uh, a little four sent me the picture of a preacher, a fellow by the name of Ransom that was in this church, tried to steal members out of this church, tried to upset the church, um, to start his own ministry. But here's what Jesus says, nobody, nobody but nobody can see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. So when a man gets up and talks about the vision of Allah, 50,000 righteous men living for the Lord, a place for Jesus to return, the land where holy ground, you can't see that unless you've been born again. You ain't gonna see it. You ain't gonna understand it. You ain't gonna, you ain't gonna, you can't see it. You can't enter into it. You can't become a part of it. You can join the church, but you can't be a part of that. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You can't see the vision of Allah. You can't see the kingdom of God. Let me retract Allah because you're thinking self-serving. You can't see the will and the work of God unless you've been born again. Case closed. Being a member, your, your mama, your daddy, your grandpappy, anybody else was, was in the church don't mean that you understand God's word or his kingdom. You can't see it. You absolutely can't see it. You absolutely cannot understand the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. All you can see is Satan's kingdom. And you're going to run around behind everybody who's in this kingdom who's got power, thinking that somebody another Kenneth Copeland got, got all that apple, those airplanes that he got power. You cannot! You cannot see God's word. You cannot! Unless you've been born again. If you haven't been born again, Nicodemus, if you have not been born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. So Nick, so Jesus clears right there that what you're saying to me is not from, from the Holy Ghost. You're saying this because you're the devil. Now the devil knows, because he does not experience the second birth. The devil knows that Jesus is the Son of God. He knows, he said it several times. Everywhere you see the devil show up in the Bible, he declares that Jesus is the Son of God. He knows it, but he's the devil. Humans cannot see Jesus unless they've been born again. And they can't see his kingdom. They can't see his word nor his law unless they've been born again. Y'all didn't leave yet? You didn't turn off the computer? I click, 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 click. <laughs> Manning is mad. Anyway, so Nicodemus, so Jesus closes that out. Let's get something clearer. Nicodemus, the only way you can know that who I am is that you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. You cannot know it without the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to them, okay, then how can a man be born when he is old? You're asking the wrong question. But he asked anyway. Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? You're asking the wrong question. You don't even know what we're talking about. You don't even understand the language. You're asking the wrong questions. You're going down the wrong avenue. 
Jesus answered and said, Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now you can join the church all you want. You can be a member and you can die in the church. But the kingdom of God is something different. See, Elder Hartfield back there, I said to him, son, he's 18 years old, I said, son, I said, the kingdom of God is in you. I don't know if anybody ever told him that. But the reason why I said that to him is because I understand I'm in the kingdom. Now, a lot of people want me to go join the world. They want me to go join Al Sharpton, get in the world. They want me in the world. They even talk about, somebody said to me, I should run for president. You got to be out your damn mind. <laughs> I'm in the kingdom of God. So when Ella Hartfield and I worked together for several years, we established a ministry called the Kingdom of God Center, bringing men in, out of the world, into the kingdom of God. And unless you've been born again, now you can join a church, and there are church people all over the place, but few there be that can see the kingdom. If people knew what was going on in this house with respect to the kingdom of God, they first of all would have to be born again. You can't, you can't be a, you can't be a, a disciple of Pastor Manning unless you've been born again. Now you can join the church. I didn't say you can't join. Join the church. But you can't be a disciple. You can't see what he's talking about. You can, Jesus said you can't see it. You can't see it. You can't see it. Neither can you enter in except you be born again. It makes that clear that Nicodemus has not been born again. And Nicodemus makes it clear with his foolish questions that he hasn't been born again. I, I, it's important for us to know as well that the earth is gonna experience a new birth. This old earth is gonna be destroyed. <laughs> Check it out. There is no way God's gonna come and establish once he defeats the demons, and the time for that is not now. We gotta wait a little while longer. The men, John the Baptist, Paul, all, everybody under the altars said, Lord, how much longer do we have to wait before you finally culminate your word and destroy the demons and reestablish your kingdom, reestablish earth in the position that it was with Adam and Eve? He said, wait, wait, and they gave him white robes. But he's not gonna do it with this planet. This one is no good. This one has been ruined by the devil. <laughs> This planet is no good for God. It's been ruined by the devil. <laughs> and he doesn't want it. By the way, heaven has been ruled, ru ru ruined as well. Heaven is contaminated because of what the devil did there. So there's going to be a new one. The Bible says, Revelation chapter 21, there's going to be a new one. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But just before that, at the end of Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, verse 11 through 13, the devil, both death and hell, will be cast into the lake of fire and the new heaven and the new earth will evolve. So, what we want to establish here tonight as we look at these demons, of course, is that anybody who doesn't keep the law or the word of God, run from them. I'm telling you, my brother, I'm just telling you, if God said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, you can't change that. You can't, you, who are you to change the word of the omnipotent God? Have you lost your mind? And who the hell is it would ever believe anybody who thinks they can change God's word? If you can change God's word, then anybody who don't like something can change it to what they like. Then God's word has no effect because everybody changes it to meet their own. You've got to be out your mind. Don't think you can outdate God's word. Don't think it can be changed. Modified, outdated, defeated, voided. It can't happen. To do that, you got to get rid of God. 
I tell you what you probably can do, you can't do this either. You can change heaven. You can absolutely destroy planet Earth before you can take one period out of God's word. Of all the periods, question marks, in God's word, capital letters, you could change, you can destroy all of the Earth before you can change the Sabbath day. I can tell you that right now. Or the tithe. Get that in, because I want to get that in as well. <laughs> and so here we are. Here we are. And the devil is wiser than his demon-inspired preachers because every time the devil shows up to do something, he doesn't come with, you know, Black Lives Matter or civil rights. He doesn't, he doesn't employ what Martin King employed, civil rights or civil disobedience, Henry David Thoreau. The devil, the devil doesn't employ himself personally understanding. He doesn't employ or deploy civil rights. It's no power to the, it's no match for the word of God. Civil rights, making laws in this kingdom is no match for the word of God. The devil didn't roll up on Jesus and say, I want to equal rights, I want, you want to have equal rights, get a committee of people to vote now that you have some of the kingdom, you can have the Republican part of the kingdom, I'll take the Democrat. The devil wouldn't do, why would he do something like that? Why would anybody think that you can cause civil rights to bring freedom to people? It ain't gonna never happen. Only the word of God, only the word of God, only the word of God. And the devil knows it and never use it. You see somebody else, you see the Al Sharptons of the world or the, or the Obamas of the world or the whoever of the world, Keisha Lance Bottom down in Atlanta Sylvester down there in Houston using civil rights, the so-called help, anybody, is a no, no. It ain't gonna happen. You want power? Preach this. You want to set men free? Preach this. You want to defeat the devil? Preach the word. And be good at it because the devil knows it too. You just can't, you just can't just, you got to know what you're doing. But you ain't going to get nowhere with Dr. King. I can tell you that right now. You, you, you'll get more suffering, get your butt kicked, get your mind shook and your money took following Dr. King or Al Obama or Al Sharpton or Kenneth Copeland or T.D. Jakes or any of them. Get your butt kicked but good until you lay out this right here, this word. This is it. I, uh, so, you probably never heard anybody say Nicodemus was demon inspired. You probably never heard, but it wasn't just him. It wasn't him alone. It was that whole crowd. You're probably going to have to think about that for a while. Pray about it. Um, and let's be clear about what we're going to be clear about. There ain't no way anybody is going to accept me unless they've been born again. Now, they may accept the church, and they may like some of the things I, because I do some pretty good teaching. Sometimes it makes people, you know, think about maybe they can prosper, but they're not, it, it appeals to them, to their inner man, but not to the Holy Ghost. You got to be born again. You got to be born again. And I say that with courage. I'm not afraid to say it. And... Um, I know that the devil hates this message. I just talked here tonight. That boy, for the last seven weeks, we've been burning him a new butthole. And he knows it. He knows it right here at this pulpit. <laughs> uh, we have just a few minutes left. Um, I have to tell you that I have not had a full week of rest in two years now, going on three. And uh, except God gave me this word today to speak to you as I, Nicodemus in particular, I probably would have done something different because I am about as tired as anything you could ever be tired, uh, just wore out. Um, however, I'm not complaining. Oh, misunderstand me now, I'm not complaining. But I do want to say that um, we are in an extraordinary time. There's no doubt about that. Um, 
And for those of you who are online, this is really a blessed house. And, and if you don't understand it, I understand why you don't understand it. I, I understand. Uh, but I pray that uh, the Spirit of God will come upon you and that you truly will be born again. Um, I also want to encourage all the people that are members of the Outlaw family, wherever you are, we are in the right place. We are the people of God. We are his representatives. We have got truth. Be confident in that. Be absolutely confident in that. And you'll always hear me preach God's word. Always. That will see us through. God will provide for us. So I want to ask, we have just a few moments left, if we could bow on our knees. What we got, four minutes? Three minutes, what you got? Four, we got four minutes. I want to ask if you can possibly, if you're at home, if you're driving a truck, don't, you know, maybe just pull to the side of the road, or if you're working, doing surgery on somebody, you know, but if you can bow for just a few moments, just like to get people on their knees. We call this a prayer meeting. Actually, it's a Bible study more of a teaching. But if you can get on your knees for just a few moments and um, talk to the Lord about being born again. You're only going to have a moment or so to do it. And... Um, and then we'll conclude for the evening. I want to, um, you can take, continue on your knees for just a moment. Thank God for the, um, for John Bartolotta's uh, gift to this house. We pray the best for his wife and sons. I, um, I'm not moved very often, but I have to tell you that the music that's coming out of this house these days is quite moving. Uh, only that he would be able to watch what's happening with our young men, our young women, and the spirit. But his song from his deathbed, Raining Angels, the courage to be able to, to sing like that knowing you're gonna die. The peace that's in that song, the peace that was in his voice and in his spirit, knowing he was just a few days away from death. Praise God. You may rise. Time for our tithing and offering, offers, offers. The tithe is a law too, by the way. We don't have to tithe no more. We don't have to tithe. That's Old Testament. That's the old law. <laughs> 
Ah, oh, Lord have mercy, the things that people say. And they, they keep jugging at me, making all kinds of weird comments, you know, since we got social media, you know. But oh, we don't have to tithe. And we, that was the old farmer's law. They used to bring chickens and cows and goats. Well, we don't do that no more. <laughs> yes, yes, Lord. At any rate, uh, praise God for the, for the meeting tonight. And thank God for those who came out in the rain to be a part of this, uh, this worship. Praise God for that. I want to ask you to come up close for just one second. And I, I want to talk to three year and older veterans of the uh, Trust in Lord Hour, uh, the Open Rewards Prayer Meeting, the Manor Report, and the Pulpit of Power, those four ministries that we do every week, uh, producing at least 20 different ministries or sermons every week. If you are a three year or older veteran, by old I mean four years, five years, six years, seven years, 10 years, 12 years uh, older veteran of of any of these ministries that we do on a daily basis every week, and you are not a supporter, you've not joined with the uh, the ministry to give your uh, to pledge your support and your alignment with what we've been teaching. I and I, my question is why? Uh, you've had three years to observe us. You've had three years to listen to us on a daily basis, all weekend, all day long, any hour of the day. We're uh, broadcasting. Uh, you've had three years to watch our various successes. You've three years to watch our ups and downs. You've had three years to listen to the tenor or the consistency of what we have said, whether we are consistent or whether we're all over the chart and what we do and what we believe. You've had three years to watch people around us who have made the commitment to join with our ministry and church and to financially support it. And by the way, I want to give another shout out to Brother Jesse Munez out there in San Bernardino, along with uh, uh, Goldfinger, who is just extraordinary giver, and others that do extraordinary uh, giving to our ministry. My question is to you, if you are a three-year veteran or older, why haven't you joined? Why haven't you committed? And I suppose some of the reasons would say, well, Pastor, man, I belong to another church. And uh, why? How could you, how could you, after three years of hearing me teach about the Sabbath, about righteousness, about the tribulation, and listen to me faithfully as you do, and still go sit up in another pastor's face? How could you be? It's like you, it's like a woman sleeping with two men. You know, one she likes during the week and the other she likes on the weekend. It is it's hypocritical. Um, how could you do that? I mean, as I say, you started three months ago. I can understand. Well, it may take you some time to evaluate. It may take you some time to look at me, to discover you know, who I am. You say, well, pastor, that's not that I don't belong to another church or ministry. I, I, you, I'm with you. But there's some things you say I like, and there's some things you say I don't like. Why? Why is it that some, you, you've made a decision that there's some things that, I, that you don't like are stronger than the things that you do like. I, you know, I am not a psychiatrist, but I am an analyst. And I have to tell you, I analyze the world and our understanding. The, the understanding and wisdom tells me this, that if there are things that a person such as myself that I am saying, there, there is no room to disagree with what I am saying, unless your purpose is to find something to disagree with. Let's say, for instance, you say, well, I like the fact that you talk about Obama, but I don't like the fact that you talk about Trump. Let's say, for instance, you're one of those, right? Well, the purpose, it isn't that you, it isn't that you just like what I say about Obama, but don't like what I say about Trump. What it is, is that you are looking for a reason to support Trump. It isn't that you don't like it. It's just that you don't like the fact that I'm saying something about it. It isn't that what I'm saying is wrong. Let me put it that way. It isn't what I'm saying is wrong or indifferent. You know it's right. But you have, you've lived your life or you've come up or you've been raised with a doctrine that you can really live in a false reality. That's where you are. You've been raised in a doctrine that you can live in a false reality. That is to say you can like the truth about Obama but you don't like the truth about Trump. And it's the same truth. It's the same truth. There's no difference. But because you have been indoctrinated 
to live in a false reality. You are really a person who needs psychological debriefing. And, and, but trust me, there are zillions of people around the world who live that way. I, there, there are people who know what I'm saying about Trump. Obama is right. They know it. But they choose to ignore it based on the fact that they find a reality that isn't true and they've settled in there. Say, well, that's one of the reasons why I've not made a commitment because, you know, I, I, I don't like, the fact, I wish you would support what I support. But the, the truth of the matter is, then why do you come? You've given three years or more of your life to listen to me? Three years of your life? To listen to me, and you know, you and you're not tired of listening to me yet. And you've given three years of your life, and over the past three years, your life has been greatly upgraded. You've learned, you've been educated, you've been enlightened. And let me say this to you: if you make the commitment, say, well, Pastor, I'm joining with you, and I'm going to support. I'm going to do the tithe and offering. I'm going to do the first fruit. I'm going to keep the Sabbath. Your life is going to soar. Now, listen to me very carefully. Now, I'm not going to leave you alone after this. Listen to me very carefully. You come as often as you come over the past three years because you're being helped. You're being educated. You're being enlightened. Right? Right. But the thing that you like, whether you, you say, well, I like what you say about Obama, but I don't like what you say about Trump. You do the same thing with the word of God, such as you like the things I say, the teachings that I say, the way I explain the Bible, the way I break it all down and make it clear. But when it comes to things like money or tithing and offering or the Sabbath, well, that you know is also true, but because of your false reality, because you really need a psychological debriefing, because of your false reality, you choose not to believe the tithe or the first fruit or the Sabbath. Now, it isn't that it isn't true. It's as true as all the other things I've said. But you live in a false reality where you, avoid, you try to ignore the truth about the tithe. And so you don't do it. But, it, not, it's not, but the, everything else I say is good to go. Everything I ever say is good to go, good enough to share with your friends. It makes you laugh. It educates you. It enlightens you. But the tithe, well... And the full commitment to the ministry, well, the first fruit offerings, well, the Sabbath. But that's all true as well. But you have chosen and you've been raised and indoctrinated to have a dual reality, which is dangerous. Jesus said this, and I'll leave you. He said, I would rather you be the hot or cold, but not lukewarm. You're lukewarm. You have a dual reality. He said, if you look warm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I would rather you be completely stomped down against Pastor Manny, trying to, dis trying to take him down. Be fully against him. Be against him with all of your strength. Or be fully for him with all of your strength. But don't be in the middle somewhere lukewarm. You're, you're better than to be spit out of the mouth of Jesus if you're lukewarm. So what's it going to be? You're going to make the commitment and grow and be even greatly better blessed or you're going to continue to walk in the lukewarm spit of the mouth of the Savior. I'm James David Manning, everybody. I'm the Lord's servant.